Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Carlick from Figure It Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey guys, it's Adam here, and today I want to talk a bit about the fact that E3 2019 is right around the corner, and this isn't specific to E3 2019, it could apply to any of them, but really it's a question I wanted to pose to all of you guys about E3 in general and the whole idea of conferences. Now, if you're unfamiliar, E3 is a big gaming event, I'm sure most of you are, if not all of you, but every year uh, major news announcements are made at uh, E3. It's like the central event for video game, the video game industry to determine where the video game industry is continuing to go. So that's when we get all the new game updates and all that sort of stuff. A lot of it happens at E3. And Every, the show, traditionally, the way it's done is that major game companies will have conferences. Now, this year in particular is strange because there's only five of them. Um, there's Microsoft, there's Ubisoft, there's Bethesda, uh, Square Enix, and then there's the PC gaming show. Now, uh, so, there'll be, so Sony's not going, Nintendo's not going, although they'll do their traditional treehouse thing. And then um, uh, EA is not doing one, Activision is not doing one, and then the other developers are kind of going to put some of their stuff inside of those shows. Uh, probably Microsoft and PC gaming, I would think. Um, so that's you know that's a sign possibly of the fact that the show is becoming maybe out of date, whatever. But that's not the point of this video. Nor is predictions the point of this video. We're going to do that separately. This one is really to pose a question to you guys and just kind of explore that question and just be more thought-provoking, I think, or hopefully. The question is, what makes an E3 conference good? Or just a conference in general for, within this context? And I know the obvious answer that everyone will throw out there is uh, the games, which sounds like the short, simple answer, right? It's like, oh, okay, video over. No, not exactly. Because that's not really accurate, and that's what I want to get into. Now, someone who has watched many E3s online, as well as someone who has had the uh, pleasure of being able to go to several of them, I've been there the last two years, I will be going there again this year, I've been invited to several conferences. I want to give kind of both perspectives uh, of when I think a show works versus when it doesn't. Uh, and why that is. And of course, uh, I want everyone to explore this as well. I'm not saying my opinions on the matter are absolute or anything like that. I'm putting out there what I think the reasons are. And if you have other reasons and feedback, by all means, put it in the comments, let's have a chat. So first and foremost, as everyone points out immediately, the games. Yes, if a show, if, if some developer came out and had no games, it would not be a good show. But that's only one factor, because it's also about the way you do it. Because uh, the way I want to put this in context here is the, the games need something behind them. They need a flair. They need to be exciting. They need to be presented well. They have to have some sort of hook or connection. Something to get you going. Because if that was the case, they could just walk out there with a piece of paper and just list a whole bunch of games, walk off stage, and then we'd all be excited. That's not how it works. Um, and you know, it'd be kind of like if you went to go see a movie, right before you see uh, the new Avengers or whatever, they have trailers for a ton of different stuff. Uh, different comic book movies, a st new Star Wars movie, all this stuff they have. Would you really get the same vibe if right before it there was just a white screen that had a you know black text of all the movies that were gonna have trailers, but instead they just said the names and then they went to the movie? You'd probably be like, okay, well I'm happy about the movie, but the trailer part was kind of mediocre. Yes, I know those movies are gonna exist, but wow. It's, it's not enough, is my point. And if you want some real world examples of that, um, Sony, in the last couple of years at their conference, uh, was kind of like that. They showed up with unbelievably good games. <laughs> like They were like, wow, we have all these awesome games, but they did a terrible job of presenting it, so it was kind of almost boring. And that's not good, you don't want that. So that's one factor. It is an important factor, but it is not the only factor. Now, if you ask me, the next most important aspect is the surprise element. Now this is by far the most difficult thing to do when it comes to a show. What I mean by a surprise factor is every single one of us watching this is watching with the hope that we see something we were not expecting to see. Something that gets us going. Now the easiest way to do that is a surprise, is to show us something we're like, wow, all right, I can't believe they're doing that, that's great. That's what we all want. 
But in this day and age, that is borderline impossible. Games are in development cycles for multiple years. Keeping that completely under wraps for all that time is extraordinarily difficult, especially in this age where you have so many people working on them in so many different facets. Uh, you know, even in, when it comes to merchandising, like infamously last year, uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey was spoiled by a keychain because somebody was, who had nothing to do with video games was just making keychains, as they were told to do, and took a photo, whatever, and it's like, oh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, I guess, is gonna be a thing. So there's so many ways to ruin stuff like that. And uh, it's just really, really difficult to pull off because you really have only two choices. You have the choice of, we're gonna try and do this surprise, um, but what we're gonna do is we want the excitement of that surprise to carry over to the release date, which is why Assassin's Creed Odyssey kind of went down the way it did, which was they, Ubisoft announced it formally at E3 with the hopes, you know, the game's gonna come out in a couple of months and we just kind of ride that wave. And that there is a logic to that. It's an advertising campaign that blasts you right into the release date. But that's the hardest way to keep a secret because of how, like I already said, so much stuff before it. The other way to do the secret is, sure, you can announce it, uh, you can just get out there and say we're working on this thing, but then the game might go the Last Guardian route where it gets announced in like, what, 2009? And you're just like, okay. And then it becomes almost a joke for how long it never came out. And now eventually Last Guardian did, of course, and that's good. Um, but it, it could also be one of those games that gets announced and never sees the light of day. Like I remember, I think it was Nintendo announced some sort of new Metroid Prime or something like that, like years ago, like 2003 is what we're talking about here. Like some sort of new Metroid game, I think, around that time. And then I think there was, there's been multiple Mega Man games announced that way that just never see the light of day. So that's the other, the flip side of it is you can do a surprise, but if there's nothing behind it, it's not, it doesn't really work. And then the excitement and the buzz and all that stuff dies eventually, especially if the game never comes out. And then you have like the weird ones, the, the very unique ones, like your Shenmue 3s, for example, where there's so much build up to it for a long time and the possibility of it happening and then it actually plays out and, and it becomes super exciting. Now, the other problem with surprise is that it doesn't work uh, unless there is some sort of hook to it. Now, an, uh, the president, of, you know, uh, Shuhei Yoshida could come out on a stage at a Sony conference, which they're not doing one this year, but he could. He could show up and he could say, all right, everybody, The Last of Us 3. And that would be exciting, even though The Last of Us 2 isn't even out yet, that would be exciting because we're connected to that franchise. We know The Last of Us. But if he came out there and said, announced some completely, new, this is a terrible title because I'm just coming up at the, at the top of my head, the beginning of us or something, it has nothing to do with The Last of Us. You know, it's a completely different franchise. You know, the beginning of the end. Let's say, all right, there's a new franchise called The Beginning of the End. It has nothing to do with The Last of Us, it has nothing to do with any other franchise they've ever done. It's no familiar characters from anything like that. It's just a brand new thing. That's just called an announcement. That's not a surprise because no one in the audience could possibly have predicted that. It's, it's because it's, not, it's like The Last Jedi logic. It's subverting your expectations by not, making, not being a good connection. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's like, sure, I couldn't necessarily have predicted all that, but that doesn't mean that's a good result. Now, that's fine. So what I'm saying is games like that, where they're brand new IPs, cannot work within the surprise context. You can't do that because no one could have predicted that because no one's excited about that possibility. So it needs to have be a sequel or a remake or bring back some famous character or possibly, if they're big enough, bring back some big developer. Like if Shigeru Miyamoto had been I don't know, he hadn't made a game in like 10 years or 20 years or something, that might work in of itself, but that's a very unique situation. So my point is, surprises. Very, very difficult, but if they're pulled off successfully, they're amazing. You know, last year's E3, I got to go to three conferences, Bethesda, Microsoft, and Ubisoft. And of all of them, the thing I remember the most, the, 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 of all the announcements, of all the things that was said at all these shows, the one I remember the best was when Elder Scrolls VI was announced by Bethesda. Now why? You know, the, if you actually break it down, all they did was stand up there and say, we're working on it, and then they showed some generic footage of mountains and trees and stuff. Why was that the most exciting? It was because it was a connection to a previously big game, and it was finally getting a sequel. Now, is there anyone who couldn't predict that Bethesda was going to make a new Elder Scrolls game at some point? Of course we all could. But the thing that made it exciting was the fact that it was official and that they were really doing it. And that was by why it was the best surprise of the whole event. You have to, but you know, that's a good one. And I, I know I'm the, the guy who always talks about Shenmue, but that one is also the model for the most insane surprise of all time because it was a 
the big franchise that was completely considered dead by everybody. There was no reason to believe that could have come back. Uh, and yet it did, <laughs> you know, like, and it did in the most insane way ever. Um, and so that, that works as a huge surprise. But that, that trick is really hard to pull off. So if you can, great. You've just, you've just done a very good job. But that's very hard. And then the other thing that is a major factor, I think, when it comes to these conferences is the entertainment value. And what I mean by that is when you're watching the conferences, you're essentially watching a performance. You're watching a play, basically. Now, you can do this online or you can do this in person. Now, majority of us will watch it online because that's how it's most accessible. Not everybody can get to go to E3. It's just not how it goes. And even if you get to go to E3, you have to be invited to conferences specifically. You can't, for those who don't know, you can't just, hey, I'm at E3, I'm going to go see the PlayStation conference. You can't do that. You have to be invited specifically by PlayStation. Um, so when you're watching online, I get why this is kind of a controversial one, because to a lot of people, watching an E3 conference is kind of like watching the NBA draft. It's like, yeah, you could watch that whole thing, or you could just get the list of results at the end. And that's how a lot of people prefer to do it, because they don't care about the dog and pony show. They don't care about any of that. But there's a lot of us that do. And that show has to be good, but not for the reason you might expect. Sure, the majority of people who watch E3 are doing it online, but I got news for you guys, that show is not meant for you. That show, like, they want you to like it, that would be great, you know, get you guys excited too about stuff, but you're there more or less to get the information, see the trailers, and move on. The people they're doing that for are the people that are in that room. And the reason they're doing it for the people in that room is you have to understand, everyone who's in that room with just a handful of exceptions, unless there's just extra seats, is people who are specifically invited to be there by that company because they have enough value in that company's estimation for them to be worthy of that seat because something about them has some sort of, I guess we call it influencer pull, where their opinions matter enough that they want those people to be happy. They want those people to have enjoyed what they just saw because then, of course, they'll go out and they'll make videos and they'll write up their articles and all that stuff giving opinions. That's what that's about. And I know that because I've been that person. I still continue to be that person. I get to go, I'm going to E3 again this year. I will be at three of these shows and I'm excited about it. But as you guys know, after the end of E3, what do I do? I go, I make videos and I talk about all this stuff. Now, I'm objective because I don't work for any of these people and if they don't invite me back, oh well. That would suck, but it's fine. But like, I'll give you my honest opinions and all that kind of stuff. So, but the idea they're hoping for is that you've gone through this performance and it's exciting to you, so you're more excited about stuff you normally would not have cared about. Or you would have watched at home and been like, meh, whatever. Like at the beginning of a movie again, where you're watching multiple trailers, and at the end of the trailer, like, meh, whatever. They're kind of hoping you're, you're more excited artificially through the entertainment value of that. It's true. It's just true. Now that entertainment value, I'm sorry, but it's important. It really is. Because you, if you don't have the entertainment value, like I said at the beginning of this, what you frankly have is the PlayStation conferences of the last couple of years where they just had, you know, like the, I forget what his name is, but they had just had a dude come out there who was like one of the high ups at PlayStation and he just kind of said, don't expect any announcements tonight. We're not doing that. Anyway, here's some trailers. It's fucking boring. And you don't want that because you don't want to associate your games with being boring. That's a huge mistake. Uh, you want to build up that excitement, even if it's artificial, just to keep that energy going so that people are excited, you know, for any of these things you're creating. Because let's face it, at the end of the day, guys, E3 is a commercial. Everything we're watching there is a commercial, but you don't want it to feel like a commercial. You want to feel like a performance. That's the key to it. Now, some of these companies try harder than others, you know, but with different tactics and so on. And one of the tactics I think that's the best is when they essentially follow... I want to say like the 1980s Oscars model, where you basically grab uh, a stand-up comedian uh, and you have them come out there and you have them be the host of the show and they're not annoying, but they go out there and they hold it together knowledgeably and entertaining. And a company, especially like Bethesda, who's very willing to make fun of themselves, Ubisoft's very willing to make fun of themselves, Microsoft not so much. Um, they typically just have their higher ups go out there and just give statements. but. You know, they're, they're more about the flashy side of things. If you notice, Microsoft shows are very much like, here, this is, we have a lot of, you know, lighting rigged up and we're going to do this like a stage play. 
with not great actors or non-actors. Whereas Bethesda usually comes out with somebody who's funny. Ubisoft usually comes out with somebody who's funny. And then they just try to hold it together through that. Ubisoft usually does like entertainment pieces with big musical numbers and all this stuff. There's a whole lot to it. It's a show, but that's important for the people in that room. So the key is, how do you make that show entertaining, entertaining for people who are just watching online? I don't know if you can, <laughs> you know, like it's, that's a tricky one. That's, I mean, of course it can be done, but it's tricky. You know, I know Ubisoft delved into the idea of using celebrity cameos and stuff, but again, that's more exciting for the people there. What you really, in my opinion, would have to do is just create a, a really good, solid performance from one host that's thoroughly entertaining, but is also somewhat known. You know, rather than <clears throat> a lot of the time they get unknown MCs who are just good on a stage and can perform that aren't known to the industry, aren't known to people. Um, you know, I, this is a dumb example because I don't think it would work. But like, let's say you had a stand up comedian like Bill Burr, who I don't think is particularly known in any way for video games. But if you had that and you had that guy being the host of like, you know, the Bethesda conference or something, that could be very fascinating. Um, I would kind of like to see one that play that way out. I've never seen that happen before. The closest to it was uh, last year, a little bit of Bethesda conference. But uh, we're kind of deviating. The point is, what you need for a good E3 conference is you need a solid lineup of content that you are proud to roll out there, that people are going to be excited about. You have to be good at making people be excited about it through your presentation style. And you need to have a list, you need to have at least, in my opinion, one legitimate surprise. Anything more is, you know, uh, is amazing, is icing on the cake, if you could pull off more than one, but at least one to make it exciting. But you, you have to do all three. You can't, because otherwise you end up with just part of it. Like, sure, Microsoft could go up there and be like, look, we, we have an entertaining show, and, uh, you know, we, uh, we can get up there and, you know, generate that excitement and all that stuff. We have a good list of games, but we need that surprise. What's our surprise going to be? Um, just announce something stupid. Just go up there and say, yeah, we're going to work on Conker's Bad Fur Day 2, when they have no plans for it. That's the other thing is a surprise has to be plausible and there has to be some proof of it. Elder Scrolls 6 worked that in that limited capacity because none of us would disbelieve the idea that they were going to work on it at some point. But it was exciting because it was official. Conker's Bad Fur Day 2 is so far removed from the original that you have to at this point not only announce it, you have to show proof that it's like real. You know what I'm saying? Like it's a unique case by case basis, and that's what makes it really tricky. So you have to have those type of things. And Congress Bad Fur Day 2 was not announced. I'm saying if it was, it would have to be like that. You can't just go out there and just roll off a list of things. Because then what happens is you get into Nintendo territory. What Nintendo does historically is they'll announce stuff that they don't intend to release, or maybe they would like it to be released, but really it's just about appeasing shareholders. Most recently, Metroid Prime 4 was announced, and that was just about appeasing shareholders. There was no development in action, and at this point, I think it's still in development hell. It was just about, hey, make sure the shareholders know that we're doing this so that our stock's stable, because if the fans are excited, then our stock goes up, blah, blah, blah. It's artificial inflating. So you can't have that. You have to have legitimate announcements. You see why it's tricky? It's not just, it's the games. But if you do all three correctly, if you have a good performance, if you have good surprises, you, know, you have a good lineup of games, well then my friends, you have the Sony 2015 conference, which I think will all time be the greatest conference that ever occurred. Yes, very near and dear to my heart because that's when Shenmue 3 was announced, but separate that, that was still an amazing conference. They were very energetic, they were excited, they were happy to be there, they knew they had the dominant spot, they knew they could keep crushing it. They announced things like uh, the Final Fantasy VII remake, uh, I believe that was also the year where they made it all official that uh, The Last Guardian was gonna finally be coming out, and they had, all, they had a bunch of cool games lined up, they had the energy of entertainment, and tons of surprises, because that wasn't just the shock of Shenmue 3. It wasn't just the shock of Final Fantasy VII Remake. It wasn't just the shock of The Last Guardian finally coming. That's three that you successfully pulled off, in addition to having all that other stuff. Uh, and that, by all, for all time, the 2015 PlayStation Conference is the model to follow if you ever want to see a really good one. Because that one also, if I mean, I remember watching that, because there were rumors out there. There's always going to be rumors with stuff. There were a lot of rumors that, you know, Shenmue 3, for the first time for realsies, <laughs> if you want to put it that way, might actually be announced that year. 
So we're, we're watching it, and then there was multiple teases. You know, like Shenmue, of course, has this big thing about feathers and like leaves and stuff. And so we see this like leaf drop, and I'm like, oh my god, it's gonna be Shenmue, but it wasn't. It was like Final Fantasy VII. It's like, oh, so it's like you're on the edge of your seat. It's like you're watching a sporting event where the game's like really close. Like it had that same energy. And that's the only one I've ever seen anywhere like that. Now, of course, I had a personal stake in it. But the idea should be that they give you a personal stake. That by watching it, there should be something about it that draws you in, that makes you go, yes, this is for me, they understood me, I get this, this is great. And um, yeah, so is it easy? Hell no. But it can be done, and it should be done more often if possible. So this year, I don't know. Let's wait for, I'll do the predictions video separately. Please stay tuned for that. So hopefully this guy's got your, your, your thought, this is a little thought provoking. Hopefully you guys have some opinions on it. By all means, if you think there's some other aspect to it that I'm completely missing, put that in the comments. If you disagree with this at all, by all means, put that in the comments. And just in general, just talk. Let's have a chat. Let's figure this out. Thank you very much, everybody, for watching. I'll see you all later.